Hey there, welcome back to Story Slices, where we slice through the best Reddit tales just for you. Let's dive right into the first story. This one is an entitled People Pro Revenge story. When my wife and I bought our house, we made sure it was in a nice, family-friendly neighborhood. The previous owners told us how all the neighbors got along great and looked out for each other. It seemed perfect to raise our two young kids, a five-year-old daughter named Zoe and three-year-old son named Lucas. About six months after we moved in, we got a notice in the mail about a new homeowners association being formed. Apparently, some of the residents decided an HOA would help keep property values up and give everyone a say in the neighborhood rules. I didn't think much of it at first. The letter made it sound pretty harmless. But then the new HOA board started coming around with paperwork, telling everyone they had to sign up and pay dues. They were pushy about it too, practically insisting we had no choice. When I looked at the huge packet of HOA bylaws and restrictions, I was shocked. There were tons of crazy rules about what you could and couldn't do on your own property. I didn't want any part of it, so I told the HOA rep that came by that there was no way I was joining. Sorry, but I don't agree with all these rules, I said politely. My wife and I aren't interested. The HOA lady pursed her lips and looked annoyed. Well, you don't really have a choice, she said snottily. These rules are to benefit the whole neighborhood. We can't allow rogue homeowners to ruin things for everyone else. I stood my ground. It's my property. I'm not joining. Have a nice day. And I closed the door. I hoped that would be the end of it, but the HOA board kept harassing us and other non-member neighbors. They acted like HOA tyrants, threatening fines and other consequences if we didn't comply. I started talking to a few other like-minded neighbors, and we agreed we would pool our money for a lawyer if it came to that. Things escalated when the HOA sent everyone an announcement that they were banning all unsightly play structures and trampolines effective immediately. I was furious when I read that. My kids loved playing on the swing set and treehouse I had built them, and our next-door neighbor's kids had a trampoline they were always playing on. The very next weekend, I was using our riding lawnmower to mow the lawn when I noticed an HOA vehicle pull up. Two men got out and started heading for my backyard. I quickly turned off the mower and confronted them. What do you think you're doing on my property? I demanded. We've been instructed to dismantle any playsets on non-compliant lots, one of the men said with authority. I was seeing red. I don't care what you've been instructed. You are trespassing and have no right to touch my property. Just then my wife came out holding our toddler. What's going on? She asked worriedly. I quickly explained while the two HOA men stared daggers at us. Before I could stop her, my wife marched right up to them. How dare you come onto our property when we are not HOA members? If you take one step towards my children's swing set, I will call the police, she shouted. The two men looked taken aback. The older one stammered, but but the HOA board ruled play sets have to be dismantled. That doesn't matter, my wife snapped. You can't force rules on non-members. Now get off our property before I have you arrested for trespassing. The two men glanced at each other anxiously before turning and heading back to the HOA vehicle. My wife and I watched carefully as they drove away. We thought that was the end of it, but the HOA board was clearly angry we had stood up to their thugs. Just a few days later, I got a call at my office from my panicked wife that a police car was in front of our house. I rushed home to total chaos. Two police officers were talking to my sobbing wife while my kids clung to her legs. I ran over and demanded to know what was happening. One officer stepped forward. We got a complaint that your kids were playing on unauthorized recreational equipment. It's against HOA rules, so we have been called to investigate. I was seeing red again, but I stayed calm and said, Officers, we are not members of the HOA. They have no jurisdiction over our property. My wife has asked them to leave multiple times. My wife spoke up tearfully. They just showed up and started yelling at the kids to get off the swing set. They scared them half to death. The officers looked uncertain. One spoke into his radio apparently requesting advice from a supervisor back at the station. After a few minutes, they announced they had no grounds to enforce HOA rules on non-members. They shouldn't have called you here, I said firmly. I expect they will be held responsible for misuse of police services. The officers agreed that falsely reporting a violation was a misdemeanor offense. They took down the Homeowner Association Board President's information and said they would be following up with her. I thanked them as they left. My wife and I were furious about the homeowner association harassing our kids. We agreed it was time to take legal action. I called the lawyer my neighbors and I had consulted with earlier. He helped us draft a cease and desist letter demanding the homeowner association stop their harassment. 
We also notified them we were filing a lawsuit for damages from emotional distress caused to our family. The lawyer served the homeowner association president with the letter in person the very next day. We were pleased to see several other neighbors had decided to join the lawsuit as well. Within a week, we received a formal letter from the homeowner association's own lawyer stating they would no longer attempt to enforce rules on non-homeowner association members. It went on to say that the entire board was resigning and dissolving the association completely. Turns out other longtime residents had gotten fed up too and threatened to sue after the police incident at my home. The homeowner association board members decided it wasn't worth the legal fees and fines to keep fighting us. My wife and I were so relieved that our neighborhood would go back to normal. No more power-hungry homeowner association trying to control what we did on our own property. We let our kids know they could finally get back on their swing set and treehouse. Their cheers of joy were music to our ears. In the end, we didn't even need the lawsuit. Just standing firm together as neighbors and not allowing the homeowner association to intimidate us did the trick. It felt so good to watch those arrogant homeowner association board members walk away with their tails between their legs, realizing they had no power over us. Our neighborhood is peaceful again. The residents made an agreement to form a voluntary community group instead if any issues came up. I'm proud my wife and I stood up for our rights, and more importantly, protected our kids from the homeowner association's harassment. We now have a no homeowner association zone sign up in our front yard, reminding everyone that our home will stay a happy playground for our children. If you enjoyed the story, please leave a like and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. The next one is a malicious compliance story. My name's Alex and I'm a technician for a company that does residential service calls. It's a pretty good job most days, but the management can be a bit much. I usually work four 10-hour shifts each week, but will pick up an extra half or full day for overtime when I can. One week, I had a family dinner planned on one of my overtime days, so I only scheduled a half shift that day. Of course, the day turned out to be a busy one. By 2.30 p.m., I still had one more job left on my schedule, but luckily the customer wasn't home, so it had to be rescheduled. I messaged my manager and the route supervisor to let them know I was done for the day. The supervisor cleared me to head back, but I didn't hear anything from my manager. Normally that wouldn't be a big deal. I was supposed to be off over two hours earlier anyway, and they never add more jobs once your scheduled time is up. So I headed back to the office, clocked out, and made it to my family dinner. But when I checked my work phone the next day, there was a message from my manager sent an hour after I'd left, saying, you are not allowed to clock out unless cleared by a manager. I was annoyed, but figured maybe I'd forgotten to include him on the message that day. But nope, I checked, and he was definitely there, and it showed he'd seen it. At first I was worried I might be in trouble, but then I had an idea. If he wanted me to wait for manager approval every day, then that's exactly what I would do. Malicious compliance time. Most days, getting manager clearance to leave wasn't an issue, but about a month later I finally got my chance. It was the middle of winter and we were getting heavy snow. I had a full schedule and was running way behind. I didn't finish my last job until almost 8 p.m. As soon as I was done, I messaged my manager, the same one from before, and the supervisor to let them know. I started driving back, ready to get home after a long day. By 8.30 p.m. I was home, but still no word from the manager. I messaged him again, asking him to clear me so I could clock out. Radio silence. I debated how far I wanted to take this little protest. I mean, I do get paid by the hour. In the end, I decided not to overdo it. But right before 9 p.m., I called him. He picked up confused. I politely explained I'd been waiting for him to clear me to clock out. Comprehension seemed to dawn on him. Oh, yeah, of course, he said quickly. You're cleared. I gently reminded him of his instructions not to clock out until personally cleared by a manager. Then I thanked him and hung up. In the message thread, I noted that I'd called and received verbal clearance. That was a few months ago now. And I'm happy to report that my manager has not forgotten to clear me once since that day. I've maliciously complied an extra 15, 30 minutes of pay every time another manager drops the ball. So in the end, I didn't get any huge revenge on my boss. He's not a bad guy overall, just a bit of a micromanager. But the look on his face when I called him that night was priceless. And I finally feel like my time is being properly valued. So for me, this small victory was sweet enough. The next one is Am I the A Whole Story? Man, some people really grind my gears. Let me tell you about the time I had a run-in with the neighbors from hell. I live in a cramped apartment building with limited parking. It's first come, first serve for the non-reserved spots. I drive an SUV, so squeezing into tight spaces can be tricky. 
Usually if I'm coming home late, I'll just park on the street rather than try to maneuver my boat of a vehicle into one of those postage stamp parking spots. But the other night I got lucky and found a spot that I could actually fit in without playing a game of parking lot Tetris. So I pulled in, centered between the lines like a champ. My SUV was the only car on that side with empty spots to the left and right. Textbook parking job if I do say so myself. Fast forward to 9 p.m. I'm unwinding on the couch after a long day when my phone rings. It's the insufferable couple from Tubi, you know the ones. They're infamous around the building for having a permanent stick up there, you know what's. Let's call them Karen and Chad. Karen's on the other end, telling me to get downstairs ASAP to move my car. Apparently, I'm blocking access to the car next to me. Which is odd, considering there were no cars next to me when I parked. With an eye roll, I head down to survey the situation. And lo and behold, Karen and Chad's SUV is now squeezed into that spot next to mine. Karen's holding their baby in its car seat, looking miffed. I take a look at both vehicles. My car is exactly where I left it, 100% in my parking space. Their passenger side door is mere inches from my driver's side, but there's still enough room for both doors to open enough to get in and out. When I point this out, Chad gets all huffy with me, going on about how they need to be able to fully open their rear door to get the baby in. As if that's my problem. Look, I get it. Loading babies into cars is a hassle. But that doesn't entitle you to an entire empty parking space as a buffer zone. Maybe I could have held my tongue. But after the day I'd had, my patience was thin. I told them flat out. If they needed more room, they should have found a different spot. Then I turned on my heel and went back inside as Karen shouted after me about their precious little one. Was I too harsh? My husband seems to think so. But in my opinion, they were asking for special treatment they didn't deserve. If you want to take up two spaces, park in the back 40. Otherwise, make do like the rest of us. Am I the a-hole here? I suspect Chad and Karen would say I am, but they also think the world revolves around them. What do you think? Comments for the story. Comment 1. Not the a-hole. You parked properly in a designated spot just because they have a baby doesn't entitle them to extra parking space. It's not your fault they bought an oversized SUV without considering parking challenges. They could have found another spot or parked on the street if they needed more room. Expecting special treatment from neighbors is an entitled move. Stand your ground, OP. Comment 2. Everyone sucks here. Your neighbors shouldn't have demanded you move your properly parked car. But you didn't need to be so blunt and confrontational either. A little empathy about lugging a baby around would have gone a long way. At the end of the day, you all have to share the parking area. Some compromise and courtesy on both sides would make life easier. Comment 3. You are the a-hole. As parents of a newborn, they're probably exhausted. Cut them some slack. While you technically didn't have to move your car, it wouldn't have been a big deal to pull up a bit so they could access their back seat. Common decency for fellow parents of young kids should override parking technicalities. Your inflexibility and lack of understanding makes you are the a-hole. Here is a potential update that provides closure. Update. After getting a lot of feedback from you guys, I did some reflecting and decided to try smoothing things over with Karen and Chad. Parking tensions had been escalating for a while in our building, and I didn't want to add fuel to the fire. The next day I went over and knocked on their door. When Karen answered, I apologized for being short with them the other night. I explained that while I didn't have to move my car, I could have been more understanding of their situation with a new baby. Karen looked surprised but appreciative. We had a constructive chat about parking challenges in our building and agreed that everyone could do better to compromise. I asked if it would help if I left a note on my car giving them permission to have me towed if I ever blocked access to their child's car seat again. Karen said that wasn't necessary, but she appreciated the gesture. Before I left, I gave them a small gift for the baby and my phone number in case they ever did need me to move my car in an emergency. Karen said I didn't have to do that, but thanked me for extending an olive branch. The parking situation seems less tense now in our building. I'm glad I chose to bury the hatchet and approach Karen and Chad respectfully. We both acknowledged we could have handled it better. Now there's one less feud in the complex. And you never know, we may need each other's help with parking again someday. Choosing kindness over being technically right was the way to go here. Thanks Reddit for pushing me in the right direction. Are you hungry for more slices of stories? Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell to never miss out on any videos. See you tomorrow at Story Slices.